from uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. I was born and raised there and moved to Seattle uh, when I was 18 in 2004. How was the transition from Indianapolis to Seattle? That's a great question. Uh, I moved to Seattle to go to Seattle Pacific University. Um, and the transition was actually really challenging. So where I grew up, there were a lot more black and brown people visible. Uh, when I got to SPU, it was about 4% people of color across the board, so not a lot of black students. And it was really challenging to go to a major, majority white, uh, evangelical Christian, um, fairly like financially well-off um, institution in terms of like who was there. Uh, I remember one time I was with my mom, I was like, I'm coming home right now. And my mom was like pretty hardcore, and she was like, no you're not. Like, but mom, I can like pay for it myself. She's like, you went there to go to school, so you need to, you need to fight it out. And so, while well, it was really challenging, I think it was probably one of the turning points in like my understanding of race and class and privilege and uh, the impact that has on people. And so I would say SPU is kind of where I started to radicalize in terms of like start to get to the root of what some of the issues are that we really face here in the United States. What really, what really provided like a catalyst for you to become the radical person you are? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it was a series of things. Um, I often think about, I think I first started to notice uh, things between my family, differences there. My father is black, my mom is white, and I could just see differences in the way in which the system dealt with my two sides of the family. I didn't necessarily have a language for it but I thought about it. Um, my dad was homeless for a lot of the years of me growing up from like age 14 up until like my early 20s. And a lot of that had to do with this law in Indiana where if you don't pay child support, um, the prosecutor has discretion to decide whether or not they put you in jail for 30 days. And so my dad went through this constant process of 30 days in and then a certain amount of time out and they would expect him to pay the full amount that he owed in child support to um, my half-sister's mom, and then when he couldn't, they would put him back in jail for 30 more days. So he would lose his job, and he would lose his housing, and he lost his car, and so it really became, a, he, he, his life spiraled out of control for him. Um, and that got me thinking about the law, and wondering, is, is this how the law deals with everyone? So when I got to college, and I started studying sociology, um, I started to realize all the big institutional and structural factors that dealt with you know, black and brown folks and poor folks a particular way and didn't deal with white people or rich people in the same way um, or even differences between the ways in which women and men are treated or non-gender conforming folks. And so I really started to ask a lot of questions when I got to college because I started to have the language to think about it. But it was something that I kind of like always noticed growing up based on like looking at the two different sides of my family. So um, I would say I thought about it growing up, but it was really when I got to college I started to develop a language to talk about it. And to be honest, at first I was just really, 18 to 22, I was just really angry. Because <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, this, this is horrible. Um, but, you know, we all gotta wake up sometime, right? Yeah. So, if you went to school in Southeast Seattle, so around here, what schools would you have gone to? Um, if I had lived here, yeah. I'm not sure where I would have gone to school because I'm not sure where I would have lived. But when I first moved here, um, after my first year of college, um, I lived down here in the South End in a house called the Antioch House, uh, where we got we got free rent um, in exchange for volunteering in Rainier Avenue Church, which is a part which is a part of Urban Impact, um, which works here at Rainier Beach. Um, and so a lot of my work first here in Seattle was at. Um, Grand Hill Elementary School, Akikurasi Middle School, and Rainier Beach High School. So I'd like to imagine that those would be places that I would have been, um, mostly because I just have such a deep love for this community. I know that Seattle as a whole maybe doesn't know how great Rainier Beach is because of the way that the media tells our story here, but this is the place where I found home. When I got to SPU and it was mostly white folks, mostly Christian white folks, mostly rich Christian white folks, um, I felt really out of place. And then I discovered the South End and I was like, Oh, my people, you know, and so um, sometimes people at school would be like, uh, oh, you're hanging out in the South End, isn't it kind of scary down there? <laughs> like, no, I love it. Um, and so this is definitely the place that helped me build a home in Seattle, is being here in the South End and at, at Rainier Beach High School. 
what inspires you to become a poet, to write, and how, how do you find the words to put into your poetry? Yeah, what inspires me to write? Um, I've always been a writer, uh, like from a very young age, um, and a lot of it has been just being able to process the things that are happening around me, um, the things that happen in my world, or um, things that I don't get to say to folks that maybe I want to say. Um, but over time, I started to see that in my writing, I was telling stories. And uh, sometimes telling those stories, I would recreate the way the story went. So if something traumatic had happened, instead of just writing about the trauma of it, I would write about what could have gone differently in it. And um, I didn't know Octavia Butler at the time, but now I do, she's one of my favorite writers. But Octavia Butler writes Afro sci-fi, and it's the idea that we can create the future of the world that we want to see by writing about it. Um, and that artists and poets of all sorts of different, you know, visual, dance, music, that by dreaming, we can actually help bring into the world the world we want. And so really what inspires me is telling stories that don't, don't always get a voice or opportunity told, but also the opportunity to speak a different kind of truth into the world that, uh, that allows us to build the world we want to see. I think poets are uniquely positioned to reveal the truth while also flipping it on its head in a really powerful way that I think um, can give voice to situations but also be inspiring. And so um, I find that I have a gift with words, which is also why I went to law school, because lawyers are all about, <laughs> all about words. Um, and while I don't necessarily like practicing law, I think that that was another tool that's helped me to think, be, be thoughtful about the way in which I use my artistic gifts to help us create the place that we want to live. What really do you feel like when you're doing all your um, advocacy and activism here in Seattle, what drives you the most? Do you have a strong passion for something or is it yeah. the, like the overarching? I mean, justice is important to me, but really what drives me is young people. Um, is the way in which there's like this energy, a zeal for being better and creating something better that I experience from writing with young people, from being around, around youth activists and youth advocates, um, and the way that y'all see the world, but also just believing that y'all are not just like the leaders of the future, but you are the leaders of today, and um, a better future actually starts here. Right, um, but I think hope also. Um, I genuinely believe we can build a, a better, more equitable, um, fair place. And I have a hard time accepting injustice. Like even as a young person, if, if anything happened that I thought was unfair, whether it be at home or at school or amongst friends, I was the sort of person to like. I just couldn't get over it because I'm like that was unjust. It was unfair. Um, and I think there, there is something in me that's naturally like cannot stand injustice. Um, but also, I just am really inspired to build something better. Um, oftentimes, I have, I have friends who um, come from Native traditions, Indigenous traditions, and they talk about how their elders teach them to think about every decision they make seven generations into the future. And that has also really inspired me um, as I make decisions to know that there are seven generations into the future that are asking us to be better and do better. Um, and since I believe better is possible, I can't just go around telling people to do it in my poetry. I actually want to be about living that life. And so doing that in conjunction with young folks like yourself, um, I, I genuinely every day feel inspired that we can build something better. So for me, it's really, it's really become a, a lifestyle of how we live together, um, and a belief that all humans deserve to be acknowledged in a dignified way, um, and deserve the right to choose how we live our lives, um, and deserve to be honored as beings here in this place, um, a part of like the environment and the earth, you know, all of those things together. How did you get into poetry? From a young age, or is it? So I, I don't like to read, and I think that that goes back to, so I had a first grade teacher tell my mom I would never learn to read. And my mom is like, 
she's the sort of woman to be like, oh, I don't believe that. She like literally taught me hooked on phonics. I don't know if, if you know about hooked on phonics, but when I was younger, there was like a commercial and they were like, hooked on phonics worked for me. And it really did work for me. But I still don't like to read. And I, I think that goes back to overhearing that teacher tell my mom that I'd never be a good reader. But what I did find in my elementary school library was some Shel Silverstein poetry. And um, the poems were short, right? And that was the first book I ever remember finishing. And I felt really proud of myself. And so I think from that moment on, poetry kind of stuck with me as, as something I just really liked. Um, but I didn't naturally start writing poetry. Um, the reason I got into performance poetry like I can do now is because I was working with a group of high school students and um, you know, I firmly believe that I cannot ask a young person to do something that I'm not willing to do as well. Uh, and so they were getting ready for a poetry slam and I was helping them edit their pieces, get their, their performances together. And one of them was like, yo, Miss Nikita, you've never, you've never slammed. And basically it was calling me out, holding me accountable to this value I say that I have. And I was like, you're right. And uh, this youth was like, well, I'm not gonna slam if you don't. So uh, I ended up going to the Seattle Poetry Slam for a Women of the World uh, qualifier. And ended up doing well, and then later won that year. Um, and it wasn't winning that got me to stick with performance poetry. It was seeing the power of performance poetry. Multiple people came up to me and were like, yo, like, I heard my story and what you said. Like, I feel, I feel recognized by you. I feel like we know each other. And I realized that there's, there's something really powerful about hearing your story from a platform and knowing that someone else gets how you're feeling or is at least on the same page with you. Um, and so I just kept writing. And um, it's become a major part of, of the work that I do. It really informs my practice around my work in community and, and work with young people. You were talking about um, working with high school students with um, poetry. How, how have you worked with students in the past? All of those um, school and mm -hmm. being like a mentor to them? Um, I think of myself as a partner. Uh, I think a lot of adults think that we know more than young people know. Uh, we don't. We know different things sometimes than young people know. And y'all know different things than we know but by no means do I think adults know more. And so I feel like poetry has become an excellent tool for conversation um, in a way that I can learn with young people and young people can learn with me. And so I really think of the work that I do about being a partner. I think the same thing in community. I think the same thing as a lawyer. I'm a partner with the person that I'm serving when I go to court. I'm a partner with young people. Like We're doing this together and I also think especially since I work um, around doing um, work with, with juveniles in the court system, I'm not a young person who's court involved in the work in the advocacy work that I do. And I wasn't court involved as a youth. And so for me to think that I have all the answers is not only ignorant, but it, it makes me look like a know-it-all. And so I really try to, to think of myself as a partner with youth because y'all should be informing the advocacy work that I do, not just informing, but directing it. Because y'all are the most impacted, right, by the juvenile justice system, which means if you're the most impacted, then y'all should be leading the change and transformation. Um, and that's really the place that I've always come from in the work that I do. You partner, um, and you learn from, and you're guided by. Um, and poetry, I think, is a unique positioning to do that, because you start talking about each other's stories. I mean, to write a, a good poem that reaches people, you got to be about the story. And so, um, in the classroom and also in poetry workshops and in SLAM, I really found that it's been a great way to build a bridge and a conversation that actually helps effectively lead us towards um, making the kind of change that uh, is transformational and not just performative and also doesn't make me the expert because I'm not the expert on y'all's issues. I'm just here to partner with and undergird the work that you're doing. What do you think is your favorite piece that you've written or spoke out on? Oh, my favorite piece of mine? Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily have a favorite piece of my own, but what I do have um, is I wrote a piece called um, 
imperfect. It's called I apostrophe M P E R F E C T, which really, if you look at it, says I'm perfect. Um, and I feel like it's the first piece that I wrote that went from me just like getting on a microphone and saying everything I wanted to say just to say it. Um, and I transitioned to writing poems and stories where the goal was to, at the end, have something transformative happen in the process of a poem. Um, and that, for me, was really a powerful realization um, about the power of performance poetry, that when you're actually thinking about wanting to engage the audience in a dialogue that trans that's transformational, in three minutes, you can actually, you can actually have an impact. Um, so I think that poem for me was when I started to first realize the power of this, this art that I kind of stumbled upon because of young people. What message do you think is one of the most important ones to give to young people in the podcast? Um, what do I think? I think you matter. I don't think that's just young people though. I think all people need to be reminded that they matter, but especially like in places like our neighborhood here, where the storyline that's told about us is always the most negative one and never and it never comes from us. It's always told by somebody else. Um, I think you matter and your stories matter um, is like one of the most powerful things you can instill in any person. But I think really I feel like my job has always been just to reaffirm that and constantly be saying, no, you matter, like what you have to say matters and, and be a part of like providing a platform for that to happen. I love running shows and creating spaces for young people to spit their poetry, do their art because at, there, there's just not enough space for that. So I like to push things out of the way and be like, here, come, tell your story. Um, You've worked with a lot of famous people on at the BBC and also the message that you, you told us about. How did these people change you and how did they affect how you, you've done your work? I'm guessing you're talking about the white privilege yeah. too uh, with Jamila Woods, Denise Smith, Matthew Warren, Ryan Lewis, um, and all the amazing musicians that, that partnered on that. Um, you know, that was a very challenging experience for me. Because uh, I, I, I love Ben as a person, uh, and Ryan is dope as well. Um, as people, they're really cool. But when we think about the system, um, and you see this cisgender white male getting to tell this story, getting to tell this story that doesn't always get, that never gets told by us, right, and the way we want to tell it, I really felt conflicted about whether or not I should be working on the project in the first place. Like, do I help this white guy tell this story that in a lot of ways the most impacted, it's not his. Like, if, if, we, if I really hold to my value of centering the most impacted, it's not a story to tell. Um, but I love hip hop, right? And so Macklemore, as, as an artist, has been able to carve out a sort of niche for himself um, and has gained some fame, right? Um, and we can argue about the merits of whether or not that's hip hop or not, like that's another conversation. But um, he needs to use his platform to talk about white privilege and he needs to do it in, in a, an accountable way. So what I found myself participating in in that was an accountable process. What people see is the song, what people see is the Stephen Colbert show that I was on with him and all the other amazing artists. Uh, what they didn't see was the 14 months of meeting with him and telling him, yo, like that's, you can't say that, that's not okay. Or like the two hour long discussions about one line in the song to try to make sure that the analysis was on point. Or the two hour long discussions about whether or not I even wanted to participate in this with him because I'm not sure I really like your music or I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with this. Um, or the undoing racism trainings that the youth are doing institutional racism came in and did with Macklemore and Ryan Lewis is a company. Um, and that was all about trying to make sure we built an accountable process. And so I think what people see is the artists and the art um, and don't necessarily get to know all the work that happened beneath the surface. That's what changed me, was 
um, seeing the amount of work that it takes just to try to produce this one song to talk about this important thing. Um, the flip side of it is the conclusion that I've come to in that process is that really what needs to happen is white folks like Ben and Ryan who have the kind of platform that they have have got to learn to pass the mic. It goes back to the bottom line of, of what I think most matters, which is, is us telling our own story the way we want to tell it. Um, and I think that's what I learned in that process, is really encouraging white folks who have privilege and platform to pass the mic. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be about undoing racism and undoing white privilege, you have to get out of the way so that black and brown folks can tell their own story the way they want to. Um, and so while there's been a lot of pushback from a lot of places and in other places like people saying great work, um, I definitely learned a lot about how do you encourage white people to pass the mic. Last thing, how do you, how do you, what do you have to say about TOC expressing? What does it mean to you as a, a group who tries to advocate for the same things or similar things as you, you're trying to say? I think simply because of where it comes out of, that it's youth-led and a youth dream and youth burn and y'all are leading the charge. Um, it means that I need to come behind y'all and come underneath y'all and be led and driven by y'all. So that really excites me because um, my work is only as good as much as I'm willing to be led by the people I say I'm partnering with. Because yeah, I'm a, I'm a black, makes queer woman, but I have so many privileges. I have a law degree, I have a master's, um, I have consistent work. So like if I wanted to, I could choose no longer, I could choose in some ways to not associate with, with those things that in a lot of ways impacted my growing up, right? I'm the black exceptionalism, I'm the one who got out, but um, I don't wanna be about that. So y'all's work inspires me because it is some place I can go and be a part of a youth-led, youth-driven movement, um, which is what has historically always changed and transformed the system. You look at the civil rights movement, um, you look at movements prior to that, you look at slave uprisings, it's always been young people who, who have led the charge in, in almost every community when it's around identity politics. So um, y'all's work inspires me because it informs the work that I'm most All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you.